Uh, We are in the third week of a sermon series. So we teach in sermon series here at Home Church. We love them. Uh, They layer upon themselves. And we're breaking down our mission statement. So we're talking about our mission statement. We're breaking up uh, over the course of four weeks as we're leading into Resurrection Sunday. So as a church, we have a mission. Why we're here. What we desire to accomplish. What is our aim and what we want to accomplish. And this sermon series is called Welcome Home because we want to welcome people home. That's the idea of our church. That's the goal. That's what we want to do is we want people to walk in and say, man, I don't know what it was, but I just felt, I just felt like I was at home. That's our goal. That's what we're going after uh, because we say there's no, no greater place to be in God's family. This, this side of eternity, there's no greater place to be uh, other than being with God's family uh, in his house. So the mission statement of home church is this. We exist to help people encounter Christ, experience life change, embrace community, and engage in calling. So these are four pillars of our church. If you've ever asked yourself, you know, been coming to home church for a while, what, what is our goal? What, what, is, what, is, what do we stand on every Sunday? Whether it's with kids, whether it's here in the main service, whether it's any outreach that we do, everything that home church does will fall in one of these four categories. And I can show you from Genesis all the way to Revelations how this is God's plan for your life. This this is God's plan for every individual that's here. His desire is for you to encounter his son, Jesus. That's God's desire for you, to encounter Christ, experience life change right now, this side of eternity, so you don't have to wait until heaven. You can experience the power of the gospel right now in your life. Uh, the Bible uses the word repent. That's metanoia, which means a change of mind. So it's, it's talking about real life change that can, that can happen now. This week, we're going to focus on embrace community. Embrace community. Everybody loves the idea of community. Everybody loves the way that it presents. But not, not everybody loves the messiness of community. Uh, because community is messy. It's a great thing. It's a, gi- it's a gift that God has for us. It's something that he desires for us, uh, but, it's, but it's messy. There's a proverb that says this, with less ox, the stable remains clean, but with many ox comes much strength. So that was nicely saying, you're, you're going to have a mess with a lot of ox, but you're going to have a lot of strength. If you don't have a lot of ox, your stable is going to be clean and everything's going to be great, but you're going to be weak. And as a church, we want to be strong. We, we want to grow because that's, that's God's goal. Like he wants to grow the, the kingdom. But we, we, we want to grow because people matter. But we, but we want you to be in a small group because you matter. So those aren't dichotomies. Those are things that are working together. So if you've got your Bible today, we'll be in Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. And then you can also put a marker um, at Ecclesiastes chapter 4. So Genesis chapter 11, and then later on here in a minute, we'll get to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Genesis chapter 11, starting at verse 1, it says this. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. One language and a common speech. They said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. So they used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build, uh, let us build ourselves a city uh, with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower and the people that the tower and the people that were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time together. Lord, your word is infallible. It's the inspired and errant word of God. We thank you for your word. God, we are humble before your word. We thank you for every opportunity that we have to gather together under your word and by the power of your spirit. So today, Father, we ask that you would um, illuminate your word to us. Help those who are close to you grow closer May they be strengthened, those who are far away from you, Lord, that they would be encouraged today. Holy Spirit, it amazes me how every Sunday you can speak to every person in the room right where they're at. And that's only by your power and by your spirit. We thank you for it. We love your word. We're thankful for your spirit. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse 6 is kind of want to hone on um, for a little bit as uh, we we get going this morning. The Lord said... If as one people 
speaking the same language. They have begun to do this. Then nothing that they plan to do will be impossible for them. Nothing that they plan to do will be impossible for them. What we read in Genesis chapter 11 is a principle that God has. And and if you're not really looking for it in Genesis chapter 11, you'll read right over it. Because when you're reading Genesis chapter 11, you come to find out this whole multitude, this whole group of people, they came together and they got this idea to build this tower and to go all the way up into the heavens so that anywhere that anybody was, they knew how to get back to that place. And what, what God says here is, 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 is something that if we read it and we take it for what's being said, we can actually learn a spiritual principle behind this. How many of you realize that, that God is wisdom? that he is, he, he is wisdom. So when he says something, uh, you might want to just kind of open up your ear and get an idea. Okay, so God, what are you trying to say here? So notice in verse 6, the Lord said this. So this is something that the Lord said. He said, if these people are speaking the same thing and they've begun to do this, nothing that they plan to do will be impossible for them. That is the power of unity. I can show you all the way through scripture how important and how much of a principal thing unity is. The Bible says in Psalms 133 that where unity happens, God commands a blessing. Jesus prays in John 17 and he says, Lord, make them one as you and I are one. And so that they may know that you love me and that you have sent me and may their love for one another show the world my heart. That was, that was, that was Jesus' plan in John 17. It was a prayer of unity. It was a prayer of people coming together. And when you take the word community, as we're talking about today, embrace community, why is that the mission of our church? Why is that something that's so important to us that we would put it as the mission statement of our church? It's because I can tell you that community is God's plan for you. Not only is the, is the church God's plan. You realize that? Like, the church is God's plan A, and he does not have a plan B. The church, as, as broken, as fragile, as messed up as it, as it can be and as it has been, it's God's plan A. How many of you have ever been or you've heard the phrase, church hurt? Nodding? Okay. Well, I'll just tell you in the nicest way, the church did not hurt you. A person hurt you. Okay. The church is God's plan A. It's his bride. It's what God uses to help people enter into God's kingdom. But uh, you've probably heard it said that the local church is the hope of the world. I don't think that that's true. I think the local church mobilized is the hope of the world. Because we can come in here and sit, and that's great, but it becomes a supper club and a dinner party. That's not what we're about. The gospel is progressive, it's aggressive. And when we read in Genesis chapter 11, when we're talking about unity, talking about one voice, one sound, and God establishes the principle, nothing that they set out to do will be impossible. How many of you have little kids or you have been a little kid or you've seen a little kid do this? They will go and ask mom for something. Hey mom, can I have blah, blah, blah. Hey mom, can I do blah, blah, blah. And they get the answer, no. Well, kids are smart. I'll take that no, and I'll go ask dad. Dad, and, and, and here's what I've noticed, is that they'll just, they'll just ask one parent, hey, can I blank? But then when they go to the other par- parent, they make it this big elaborate thing that they get to be a part of. Hey, dad, I got this great idea. What do you think about having a brownie together? Wouldn't that be great? You'd be such a great... But they go to the mom, and they're like, hey, mom, can I have a brownie? It's like, no, get out of my face. No, we're not doing that. But they go to the dad, and it's like, oh, here's this great elaborate prank because they know dad loves brownies. I'm not speaking for myself. I'm just putting it out there. Like, if the shoe fits, whatever. Because kids, like, they're not meaning to, but do you understand what they're doing? They're causing division because they're, go- they're going to mom, not getting the answer that they want, so they go to, they go to dad. I've learned this very quickly. And I hated hearing it as a kid, this response when you go and you ask the other parent, hey, do you think I can? And then you get this response. Well, what did mom say? (laughs) You got me. Because when, when mom and dad are on the same page, junior's in trouble. Because, because they're speaking the same language. They're on the same page. 
Or maybe you've seen it or you've been a part of where dad's like, man, that is a great idea. Let's do a brownie. And they're sitting out there eating brownies and mom comes around the corner and everybody's getting a busting. Like every, everybody's going to get one. And then the kid's just kind of like, because mm, he knows what he got away with. It, but, but it's just, it's a principle that works as a church, but it works for you individually. Uh, Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 7. He talks about the disunity within himself. He said, I want to do this, but I do this. I desire to do this, but there's something inside of me that's just like, oh, what do I do? And it's this inward disunity because y your flesh wants to do something to gratify itself, and your spirit is saying, no, that's not what's best for you according to God's word. And it's this inward wrestling. When there's unity, when there's unity, then things can move forward in your marriage, in yourself, in your business. When there's unity, business owners or people that, that work for a business, you send somebody out to a job and they do something, you're like, that's literally not what I said to do because there's not unity. There's not clarification. And God's telling us this principle from the beginning in Genesis chapter 11. If they're talking the same thing, things are going to work out. Think about the word community common unity. Do me a favor. Think of your favorite color right now. Just in your head. Think of your favorite. What's your favorite color? Think about it in your head. What, what's your favorite color? Now, I'm going to go three, two, one, and then I want you to yell out your favorite color. And, and yell it to the point where you scare the person that's sitting next to you. So I want you to just scare them. I want you to be that loud, that aggressive. I just want you to yell it. And Kinsey, just tuck her in there. Just tuck, tuck her real tight. But we're going to yell, okay? So prepare yourself. Think of your favorite color. Tommy, I know you can yell. I've watched you watch Brown's game. I need, I, need you, I need you to yell. Think of your favorite color. Three, two, one. Blue. All right. So got a blue, got a pink right here. Got a purple. I heard like a little purple going on over here, right there. Okay. All right. So now here's what I want you to do. I'm just going to pick a color. This isn't my favorite color. But just to get on the same page, let's all say green. Okay. Now, now we're just going to whisper it. Okay. So we're not going to yell it. We're just going to whisper green. I'm going to go three, two, one, and then we're all going to whisper green. Okay? Three, two, one. Crispy. I mean, that was nice. And there's unity in that. So when we're all yelling our favorite color, I mean, you've got pink and purple and you've got this, and everybody's pulling different directions. But when we all just whisper green, it's, it's powerful. People want to listen to it. Cody? Let's have some dueling banjos. Okay, so I've got a guitar here, and Cody's got a guitar, and we want to lead worship for you this morning. Don't worry, I'll let Cody sing. <laughs> All right, sweet. Okay, you play your favorite song, and then I'm going to play mine. Um, one, two, skiddly diddly do. You love it? One, two, go. No? That's not it, right? So he's playing a chord and I'm playing a chord and they're kind of clashing against each other. Okay, you play and I'll follow. <laughs> so it's it's all centered around this idea of maybe it's not all about you when it comes to unity maybe maybe it's just not about you like if it's god's plan for the world to know his one and only son and he's given the church the mission critical agenda of being on the same page he's given us the manual he's he's told us what to do one of the hardest things to answer as a pastor is when people ask well why do they do this my only response is well jesus is the son of god he lived a sinless life he was born of a virgin God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And I start naming out principal things that we can agree on, things that are common to us. If you want to grow spiritually in your relationship, if you want to grow as a Christ follower, one thing that I know is important and imperative for you 
is to live a life in community. It's imperative. Because if you can find yourself living in Christian community, you're going to find yourself growing because it's not always going to be about you. Jesus said, I've come into the world to be a servant, not to, not, not to just get served. He said, I've come to serve. I've come to play a part, to be a part of a team. If you want to grow spiritually, it's going to take you engaging in the community of the church. It, it's, it's something that's imperative for you and I if we want to grow spiritually. Obviously, Bible reading, prayer, all of those disciplines, are, they're great and they're wonderful. But one of the number one things that you and I need is to be in Christian community, in the church, with each other. It's imperative. If you've got um, your Bibles, and we're going to go from Genesis chapter 11, and we're going to read in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. How many of you have ever said this to yourself? Well, I can't do that because I'm too busy. How many of you have ever said too busy? Let me see. You, you, you've ever said too busy. Okay, so everybody's been too busy to do something, right? Somebody asks you to do something, hey, I've got something going on, I'm too busy. How many of you, you would describe your life as busy? Raise your hand. Busy, I'm a busy person. You'd say you're busy, okay. So here's what I want, I, I just want to help you a little bit, okay? If you're a busy person, in, instead of saying I'm too busy to blank, so a lot of us will say, well, I'm too busy to go to the gym. I'm, I'm too busy to eat right. I'm too busy to go to church. I'm too busy to blank. I'm too busy to play ball with my kid. I'm too busy to... We say all these two busies. If you could just change the language to this, I would, but I don't value blank. So just change the language. Because if we're talking about unity and we're talking about the importance of unity and embracing community, and for us, sometimes we don't see the value in that, what we have to do is, is we have to make it so real. Well, I'm too busy to get in, in a home group. I just got too much going on. Well, I'm too busy to grab coffee with another believer. I, look, look, I, I'm just busy. I got stuff going on. Well, I'm too busy to just instead of saying that, remind yourself, well, I would, but I don't value spiritual growth. I don't value my marriage. I don't value prioritizing my kids in a godly relationship and showing them that example. Change the language and you'll find yourself start, start shifting in your priorities. Because these people in Genesis chapter 11, they had the same priorities. They were waking up. They were making the same brick with each other. They were using the same mortar. They all got started at the same time. They all worked hard. It's because they were in unity. They were one mind. They were one accord working together. So Ecclesiastes chapter 4. So let's take that principle and then let's make it personal for us. This is something that Jesus modeled as well. He modeled life in community. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 starting at verse 9. Two are better off than one. For they can help each other succeed. If one, uh, if one person falls, the other person can reach out for help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people laying together, can keep, uh, laying together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better uh, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. How many of you have ever heard the phrase that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink? Okay, my job today is to salt the oats. When it comes to you living life in Christian community, having relationship with each other, really valuing what God values, doing life together, I can, I can lead you to the water, but I can't make you drink, but I can salt your oats and, and, and show you from scripture, man, this is important. This is something that God values. This is something that's a high priority for him. So I want to break down Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and I want to show you intentionally how this is God's plan for your life to do life and community. Number one, when it comes to the idea of work, your, your work, we all work better together. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9, it says this, two are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. Two are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. You have more return on your labor when you're doing life in community. When you're doing life together outside of just you and your spouse or you and your fiance, you and your wife, you and your wife and your kids. I love your family unit. I believe in family, but you need people in your life that are Christians that are pushing you towards being closer to Jesus. Somebody that you're co-laboring with. Um, one of the greatest, greatest examples of, of this talking about work is um, just the example of like energy versus synergy. 
So, so energy is just self-exuded effort that, that you can try to apply. Synergy is when people come together and they're working and it's, it, it has this centrifugal effort towards it, which means there, there's just a great strength behind something layering upon the other. Uh, there, there's a study that they did on Belgium horses. Belgium horses, it's the strongest horse that we know of uh, as far as a, a workhorse that is alive today. A Belgium horse by itself can pull 8,000 pounds. That's how strong a Belgian horse is. They, if, you, if, you put, if you strap them up, they can pull 8,000 pounds worth of weight. So if you're a mathematician, if you put two together, you would just double it, and that would be 16,000 pounds is what you would think. So if you put two together, it's 16,000 pounds. But when you put two Belgian horses together, they actually pull 22 thousand pounds together just because they're working together so it's this idea of energy versus synergy there's more effort when two are working together so you would think naturally sixteen thousand pounds but they really pull twenty two thousand pounds what i found out in another study that had that was looking at belgium horses they agreed with all of these numbers but they took it a step farther they found two belgium horses that were born and raised in the same barn and around each other, and they were used to doing work together, that number went from 22,000 pounds to 32,000 pounds because they had been around each other so long. They were born in the same barn. They worked together. They had, they had, they had this pattern of working with each other. I can't tell you how important Christian community is. I can't tell you the value of sitting across from somebody and talking to them about things that are going on in your life, talking to them about things that are going on in your marriage, talking to them about struggles that you're having with your kids, talking to them about a breakup, talking to them. I can't tell you the value of it. I cannot, I, the only thing that I can do is tell you God values this. The only thing that I can do is pull out a story of a Belgian horse to try to get it across to you. If, if you would just stick in it, if you would just stick in it, the thing that you're working on, it will produce. People get frustrated over their, them not seeing uh, changes in the short term, so they give up. But if you, if you keep after over the long term, you're going to see dividends. It's the compound effect. When, like when you look at finances and you're, you're investing, in, in your, it, it, it's, it's not what happens up front. It's what happens years down the road. And that number starts compounding and compounding and compounding. If I asked you today, do you want me to write you a check for $5 million? For $5 million how many of you raise your hand? You'd take $5 million today. I would too. I'd love to build a building. It'd be awesome. So if you got $5 million, you just send it right here. I'll just, we'll just build it. $5 million. So if I ask you, do you want a check for $5 million, or do you want one penny that doubled every day for 30 days? Which one do you want? Do you want one penny that doubles every day for 30 days, or do you want $5 million? If you take one penny and you double it for 30 days, you'd have just over $5 million. But if it's a month with 31 days, it's over $10 million. Because people don't understand the principle of compounding things, working together. These Belgian horses, 32,000 pounds. It's this idea of return on labor. Point number two, so not only is, you, is your work more benefited, but your walk is benefited. You're strengthened in your walk. In verse 10, it says this, if one person falls, the other person can reach out to help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. They're in real trouble. If you fall and you're by yourself, you are in real trouble. So I just want to tell you today, you walk more securely with somebody than by yourself. You walk more securely with somebody than by yourself. The Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 24. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encouraging one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but it's one day sooner than it was yesterday. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews that, that our, our role with each other in each other's life is to encourage each other. So I don't know if you need a, a pat on the back or what you need, but I'm just, to be real honest, there's not a person that's in here today that did not think, well, I could just roll over today. Not a person. There's not a person in here that doesn't have something else they could be doing. 
There's not a person in here that thought, man, I sure would like to take a long way around, stop by Bob Evans, get me a biscuit, and head on to the house. Like, all of us have that going on. But somewhere inside of you, there was this something that's like, we're, we're actually going to go. Like, you've made up, you internalized the decision, you, you made a goal, and, and your walk became stronger because you made the decision to go. And now you're here, and my, my job is to follow Hebrews chapter 10 and encourage you and say, great job. You came. Despite all the things that were trying to tell you not to come, that inward voice, that thing, that, that, that thing of negativity was like, hey, let's just stay in the house. Let's skip out this week. Congratulations. You made it. Great job. But I want to ask you, who's doing that besides me outside of Sunday? Who's telling you, hey, great job. Way to stay in that Bible. Hey, great job. Way to stick it out in your marriage. Hey, great, great job. Way to really work at things. Hey, great job. Way to, way to overcome that defeat that you just had. Hey, Way to keep going. Way to keep showing up. Great job. Don't give up. Who's, who's doing that? Who's walking alongside you and encouraging you and saying, man, you're doing it. This might be a tough day, but you're doing it. Number three, so we've got work, walk, and then number three is warmth. Warmth. Verse 11 says this, likewise, two people laying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? Whether it's today or tomorrow, at some point, you are going to need courage and support. You're going to need it. You're going to need courage, and you're going to need support. Likewise, two people laying close together can keep each other, can keep each other warm. So Solomon is the one who's writing this, and I believe he's obviously talking about something that we can understand physically. But I want to talk to you about maybe a, an area of your soul that might be cold. I'm talking about so, somewhere that, that you've said, you know what, I don't know about you, but like my, my parents, they started coming to church to save their marriage. Their, their marriage was in the dumps, and they said, well, we've, we've literally tried everything else. We're, we're, we're going to try church. They, they, had a, they had something cold in their soul going on there. Maybe you're here today, and you've been wrestling something, and, and there's, there's an area in your soul that's cold. I, I just want to know, like, who's talking to you about it? Who knows you enough to say, okay, like, thank you for the fine answer, but what's really, what's really going on there? Like, you said marriage is cool, but, like, can we actually talk about what that looks like? Like, practically, like, what does that look like? And can you just tell me, like, really, what does that, like, who knows you well enough to know when you're cold in an area? Who loves you enough to challenge you in that area, to grow stronger? to really be encouraged in that area. Who, who do you know? I'm, I'm, I'm just salting the oats. I'm not saying you have to, but I'm just saying you might need somebody that can keep you warm in an area where you might be cold. Number four is this warfare. Warfare. Verse 12 says this, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. I'm just going to tell you, you are going to be attacked. It's coming. You're, you're going to be attacked. It's going to happen. The Bible says that the enemy roars around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Who are you walking with that's going to war, that's going to war with you? But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even, even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. We all need someone to fight alongside us. I need someone so that I can have dividends on my work. I need somebody that can strengthen me with my walk. I need somebody that can keep me warm on those cold days in my soul. And I need somebody who's going to war with me when I, when, I need, when I need a friend. When everything in me is telling me to back out, to, to pull out, to give up, all those things. Who, who's going to come alongside me? In those days when I hear things that I don't want to hear, when I get news that I really didn't want, like, like who, who's going to be there that day? So that's, that's just personally for you. Like, that's just, that's just personally. The value of embracing community, that's your, that's your personal responsibility. What does that look like for us as a church? Like, if we're talking about the importance of individual community, like, if you hear anything today, hear that. Like, and here's what I mean. Like, I'm just, you, I will beat this drum every Sunday if this is the only drum that I beat. This is not enough for you. Sunday is not enough for you. It's not enough for me. It's not. If you want to grow spiritually, Sunday is just not enough. 
you, like, I wish that I could come and grab people over here and walk you over here and introduce you to over here. I wish that I could just name all of these people that are in our house that are pillars of faith, that are people that I look up to, that, that literally have been serving the, the Lord for years. I wish I could just, hey, stand up. And then I wish I could tell people that haven't been serving the Lord, look, to, get their number, buy their coffee, take them to lunch, pick their brain. You need them. I can't do that for you. But I can tell you on days when I have cold days, when I have frustrated days, when I have down days, I don't know why, but somebody that I'm connected to just happens to call me. Hey, man, how are you doing? And I, I give them the same facade. Man, everything's great. Praise the Lord. All it is, well, tell me about, hey, you're digging now. Watch out. But I've got people in my life who dig. You need people in your life who dig. That's for you personally. What does it look like for us as a church? In Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 23, it says this. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be full. That word compel in its original writing is where we get the word agonize from. So as Jesus is talking and he's sharing this parable about going out to the highways and the hedges, he gives this beautiful sermon illustration. He says, hey, invite him in. Nobody comes. And then the master of the ceremony says, well, go get anybody who will show up. I just want the wedding. I just want the ceremony. Whoever will come, just tell them to come on. So he goes out and he pulls highways and, and compels them. He agonizes for them. Hey, come and sit at this table. There's going to be great food, great drink, great community, great gathering. And the masters of ceremonies, you're going to love him. He'll fill every void that's in your heart. It's going to be the greatest dinner that you've ever been to. Jesus gives this example. He says, go and compel them to come. That's our role. That's our responsibility as the church. And I'll just tell you in the nicest way, they're not, they're not just coming. 5% of people that visit church just come because they walk by a building or see something online. 5%. Five, 5%. That means 95% of people who are coming and engaging in Christian community are there because they're sitting next to a friend or they've made a friendship. There's statistics to back all of this up. Seven minutes, when someone pulls on a parking lot, in seven minutes, if, if they haven't made a friend, they've made up their mind that they're not coming back to the church. That's before worship, that's before a message, that's before they check in their kids. I can't tell you how important community is. Will you do me a favor and stand with me? Community is vital. This church doesn't exist just for you and me. I mean, I love it and it's great and that's what we're here for. We exist for the city. We exist to compel them because embrace community is twofold. One, you as a Christ follower, you have to embrace personal community but all of us together collectively, we have to embrace that God's put us here in this city during this time period for a time such as this. Look at what the Bible says in Acts chapter 17. Paul was going around doing missionary journeys and Acts 17 and verse six says this, when they couldn't find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other Christians to the town authorities. They said, these people are turning the world upside down. They yelled and now they've come here. Paul was going around and he was, he was doing missionary journeys and planning churches. And, and this is what they said about Paul and his group of disciples. These people are turning the world upside down. So when we talk about embracing community as a church, on one, on one side of the coin, it's important for you to engage in community. It's, it's vital that you embrace that in your life as a practical spiritual growth principle. But just as much, it's also vital that we don't just sit here and expect people to walk in. Like my job is to equip you to go and do ministry. That, that's my role, is for you to go and do the work of ministry. I love this quote by an unknown author. There's a few people that say that they've quoted it, but I'm just gonna put unknown, because you know how it is. Pray as if everything depends on God and work as if everything depends on you. Pray like everything depends on God, but work like everything depends on you. Would you do me a favor with every head bowed and every eye closed?